Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Canadian Orthodox Broadcasting in our Maletti. We are studying Mark's Gospel and last Sunday, the last Maletti, we talked about the uh, ministry of John the Baptist, which is sometimes uh, the whole fullness of it isn't understood. All that he was trying to accomplish and the way he was trying to <coughs> prepare the way for the Messiah. So we discussed that at some length. And now we go to the actual ministry of Jesus Christ. And we notice that in the ministry of Jesus Christ, the first thing that we encounter is, is healing. And also the power of Christ over, the authority of Christ over the demons and over evil and the things that create evil. So John has demonstrated that our Lord Jesus Christ is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit, that he's not going to baptize in blood, he's not going to be a warrior king or something like that, that his ministry is going to be spiritual and he's going to reveal something to us. And what he reveals to us is that our salvation consists in healing, healing our fallen human nature and uh, healing the weaknesses and and the passions that we develop in life. And we're going to find out also that we have to cooperate, that God's not a heavenly dictator or something. He's not going to bully us, but he's going to reveal to us and ask us to follow or call us to follow him. So Jesus Christ, after uh, going back to the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, he calls apostles and Really, in, in the gospel, all he says to them is, come and follow me. And something speaks inside their hearts, and they, they are moved by, really by grace. And they leave everything behind, and they go and they follow Jesus Christ. And uh, they're not certain yet why, or even what, because Christ hasn't taught them yet. But they know that something inside says, yes, I need to follow this man who called me. And uh, so this grace moves within them and they become, become the first apostles. But there's no coercion, no way they're forced. Nobody compels them to follow Jesus Christ. They follow him of their own will because something speaks deep inside them when our Lord Jesus Christ, when his voice is heard. And later our Lord Jesus Christ will say that the sheep know the voice of the shepherd, and they follow him. The somebody who's not the shepherd, the sheep don't hear his voice and they don't follow him. So the true sheep will recognize the voice of Jesus Christ as the true shepherd, and him they will follow, but another they won't follow. So the, these uh, men have their hearts open. And Andrew in particular has been with John the Baptist. He's come to that repentance that John preached and John, he received the revelation of John. So he and his brother Peter, when they hear the voice of the shepherd, when they hear the voice of Christ, their sheep prepared to follow the true shepherd. So they leave everything and follow. And then when Jesus is teaching, and when we see that he has authority uh, over the unclean spirits and over illness as well, then the people are amazed and they say, he speaks with one with authority and not as the scribes and Pharisees. Now the interesting thing is that the scribes and Pharisees spoke with power because they did have power. They had political power. And in a way they had a kind of authority but nothing like what Jesus Christ manifested because this was an authority that spoke with, not with arrogance and not with bullying, but spoke directly to the heart. And was the, the evil spirits had to respond to it. But also their own hearts were lifted up at the sound of his voice and they were ready to follow as well. Again, those who were not the sheep though wouldn't follow because they wouldn't recognize the master's voice. Uh, one of the, the healing that we had today is also spoken of already in, in, in Mark's Gospel. And in this case, the young man who has epilepsy. Well, we see that Jesus Christ has gone to Peter's house 
and he found Peter's mother-in-law sick with a fever, and he, he raises her up, and she's instantly healed, and she begins to look after the guests to show hospitality. And uh, in the second chapter of Mark's Gospel, the boy with epilepsy is brought to him. And our Lord Jesus Christ heals the epilepsy. The apostles and the disciples weren't able to do that. They didn't have that kind of authority. And our Lord Jesus Christ is showing that his authority, he said, you know, you have to ask with the real faith, but you also have to ask with prayer and fasting. In other words, you don't just get the voice of authority plopping out of the sky. You have to struggle for it, you have to do something. You have to work toward purifying yourself so that you can cope with it. See, one thing is that if a person is given one of these special gifts of grace, without any struggle or without being humbled first, then they can fall into pride so easily and lose their soul. I was thinking of Joseph in the Old Testament. And you know, Joseph had these revelations about himself and his brothers bowing down to him and all that. But he was a bit of an arrogant twit. He went around boasting about it to his brothers. And of course, uh, that was his pride and arrogance. And the brothers got more and more irritated all the time. And finally, as you remember, they threw him in a pit and ended up selling him into slavery in Egypt. As uh, Joseph later says, you meant, you meant it for me for evil, but God meant it for me for good. And in the end, after Joseph has gone through humiliation and degradation and been humbled, then he can fulfill what God's called him for. He has to go into Egypt. Uh, he has to be falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison for something he did not do, that he was completely innocent of. And uh, even in prison, he somehow excels. But he has to go through this humbling process first because it's so easy to fall into pride and to lose our souls. And that's why we say that sometimes our virtues can be a sin because our virtues can be the source of real pride and of self-righteousness and arrogance. So we have to be rather careful about how we, we cope with even the more positive aspects of us. So our Lord Jesus Christ reveals now what's so important for us to always remember, that the whole ministry of Jesus Christ was a healing ministry. It had nothing to do with being a, a sacrificed to satisfy God's justice or something like this but really to heal us. And in the end, we can see that Jesus Christ does know our humanity because he lived in our humanity. That he does understand us, that he does comprehend our struggle because he lived it. And so it's, it's for us to accept when we're humbled that it's necessary, <clears throat> that this is in God's plan and it works together for good. As he says, all things work together to good for those who love God. And uh, so the, the reading today is kind of a nice cap on this. We read Matthew, Matthew's version of the healing of the epileptic. But that, uh, that this, this, this healing ministry also, as we see, it's very upsetting to scribes and Pharisees and uh, others. Uh, why particularly the Pharisees, this one particular school of Pharisees who were so rigorous and so rigid. They're the ones who are always upset that were other Pharisees who weren't. But uh, they were more fair and even-handed, some of them. But Christ is looking more at the Pharisees because the Pharisees had the truth, essentially, but they buried it underneath their own pride and arrogance and all kinds of traditions of men. In the Orthodox Church suffers from this traditions of men a great deal. Uh, we can call them superstitions, but they're various traditions that are picked up and each country has its own. Uh, every nation that we come upon has a whole host of these traditions that have nothing whatsoever to do with Christ or the Gospel. Some of them we share in common, like the evil eye. I think, uh, you know, everybody in the East has some idea about that. Uh, but we all have the traditions in Serbia, if you make a vow and you strike two rocks together after you make the vow, then you'd rather die than break the vow, even if it's a stupid vow like Jephthah made. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what 
they might do in Romania that way, but uh, <laughs> Romania has <laughs> plenty of superstitions of its own. And, uh, you, you know, Russians are, uh, are peculiar in that you, you can't keep them from going to fortune tellers. Uh, you know, the old women in the village who drop wax in cold water and tell the future and that sort of thing. Um, or burn your hair and tell the way the ashes look, you see. And this is going to tell your future. Uh, you know, if it was that easy, <laughs> we, we'd have a lot less problems in this world. <laughs> but in any case, it does, you know, the, the old woman sets a vessel of cold water on your head, drops, uh, let wax drop into it, and then reads the shape of the wax. And this, this wax is supposed to have intelligence, and it's going to tell you the future. So. Uh, I remember when I was at university, somebody talked me to go to a, a, a gypsy woman who read tea leaves, or tea cups in the, uh, and she also read coffee grounds, we got Greek coffee. And uh, you go to see her, well, I, I went in, and okay, okay, I'll go. And I went in, you know, wearing an, an army great coat and my hero, the uh, Soviet hero medal, uh, looking like Joe Student from the university. <laughs> And of course, she looked at the tea leaves and said, Oh, I see many books in your life. <laughs> and much paper. I said, That's a pretty good guess, but I look like a university student. <laughs> and she said, Oh, and in the future you'll travel north and to the south and to the east and to the west. I said, Well, yeah, it's either that or up and down. <laughs> but, but anyway, there's some people who believe this stuff, absolutely. You know, Oh, well, how did she know? Okay. I just looked like somebody who hadn't done his homework yet. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, we have these, these traditions, and some of them were actually useful. I mean, the thing about washing your hands before you eat and uh, scrubbing pots and pans and plates and things like that, and not eating uh, food that might have trichinosis, um, food that if it isn't cooked extremely well is going to make you very, very sick. And of course, shellfish you couldn't eat because they didn't understand about red tide. And we know you, you can't eat shellfish if there's a red tide, but otherwise you can. But if you eat shellfish when there's a red tide, you're likely going to die from it. So they just banned shellfish altogether. So there were some, some things that made a great deal of sense. And um, uh, other things that, um, um, that really didn't make a lot of sense. So th this is the one thing that Christ is trying to push these things aside and say, you know, trust in God. Don't trust in, in fortune tellers or magic or any of these others. Just trust in God. That, uh, <clears throat> you know, people still insist that you can look at the stars and tell a person's future. And the difficulty is that the stars, all of the constellations, have shifted a great deal in the last thousand years, and a couple of them we don't even see in the northern hemisphere anymore. So it's a little bit difficult to sustain that idea. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not just physical illnesses and spiritual illnesses, but also the illness of our own minds and concepts that sometimes carry us away and get us. And uh, so that's what our Lord Jesus Christ is healing people from all of those things. And uh, trying to set us back on the course of having just faith in God but also enduring some of the things that come along uh, because they're there for a purpose too. That, that we have to, as Apostle Paul is talking about the things of the weakness of the apostles in the epistle reading today. And without those things, as Paul says, I, I have a thorn in the flesh to buffet me. Well, how is Paul going to keep from falling into pride and arrogance and, and uh, almost boasting of the power that's been given to him, unless there's something there to humble him. And we know that Paul was going blind at some point because his eyesight was so bad that at times he had to be led around. And he would might ask God to take away this infirmity, but God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And uh, see, but he couldn't function toward the end completely on his own. Somebody had to lead him and guide him because his eyesight was really failing quite badly. And um, everybody needed something like this to, to really give some kind of humility. And the more gifts of grace a person would have, the more of these gifts that Apostle Paul mentions, 
the mother would have to endure some kind of humbling in order to bear them with, uh, with, without being destroyed by the very gifts that they had. So that, that's why we should uh, be, be very careful what we ask for because together with the gift there has to come a humbling because we're humans and we're frail and we're failing. Uh, I, I remember a story in the Desert Fathers where one monk, monk had, um, in this case, his sexual passions were quite strong and he kept praying and praying. Went to the elder, prayed to have them removed. And um, the elder said, are you, are you sure? It would be better to struggle against them and conquer them. No, I can't endure anymore, so pray for me. So they prayed and, and the passion was completely removed from him. And after a few weeks he came back and says, I will pray that my passion will come back. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, because that one I understood. The one I have now I don't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know how to deal with it anymore. So we have one that we, could, we, we understand and we can deal with it. It's better than one that we don't understand and, mm -hmm. and really can't deal with. So, um, and pride is the hardest of all the passions to deal with, really. Uh, it, it's an addiction that can set in and become something that, you know, we, we can even destroy our relationships with it. Uh, we can destroy a marriage with it. We can destroy a friendship. Then we start falling into pride and developing some kind of arrogance. And so it's a very difficult um, thing to struggle with, of course. But anyway, our Lord Jesus Christ is healing. So he's, this, is, this is my ministry. I call the apostles as I walk along the sea, and they are the sheep. Therefore, they hear the shepherd's voice, and they follow the shepherd because they're my sheep. Uh, but it, if he speaks to somebody who's not of the sheep, who's heart is closed, they're not going to recognize his voice and they're not going to follow him. And uh, another shepherd will come along and they're not going to follow him because they know the, they know the voice of the master. And so we see this symbol calling the apostles. So we see that John is preparing people to understand that Christ is not a military messiah, that he's not going to conquer the Romans and conquer different lands, that he's a spiritual messiah who's coming to open the gates of paradise to conquer the real evil in the world, which is within each one of us, and which is uh, uh, a sickness or illness that afflicts mankind. I mean, mankind is naturally good, and humanity is naturally good. But uh, evil afflicts us like a parasite, and Christ has come to show us how to heal that parasite within ourselves so that we can help to heal it within the world around us. And this also has to be a part of the message, though. We think, oh, I've become a Christian, and you know, we have this born-again cult. And, uh, but it's very arrogant and condescending toward other people. And it's really counterproductive, because people boast about being better than others by having been, as they say, born again. And never pay attention that Christ said to be born again of water and the Spirit. He never said to be born again of an emotional experience, but of water and the Spirit. Because this is something that takes place in the grace of God. It's not our work of building ourselves up to an emotional experience. So it's the grace of God through the mysteries of the church that we're born again from the world into the body of Christ. Born into the body of Christ, born into everlasting life. And, uh, but we can see how easy it is for a group to actually become a kind of a, an arrogant or self-righteous cult. That, and then the, the, uh, this uh, strange teaching about the rapture, which was invented only in 1840, and it was unknown among Christians until 1840. And, uh, but it's always, I'm going to be raptured probably or not. You know? And I'm going to be up here watching you suffer because I'm going to be raptured and carried away. Well, then you, then, when, you, when you really believe, okay, I'm born again, I'm going to be raptured. I can be as careless as I want. I can be as hateful as I want. I can be as arrogant as I want. I can do all, anything I want because I'm born again. Therefore, God is obligated to rapture me, and I will be raptured, and you'll suffer, and I get to watch you. I get to watch your suffering so I can take pleasure. Uh, so you see how perverse and how demonic teachings like the rapture and born againism are. They're really demonic delusions. And but they're based in this pride and arrogance that comes from not 
not being cautious and careful and seeing exactly what it is that Christ is teaching us and what he is trying to heal us from. So uh, the, the, all of humanity is essentially good. And the fact that we're afflicted with the parasites uh, as sort of viruses of sin and temptation, um, we're trying to come together as a body of Christ and struggle with these things within ourselves, but realizing that we need each other. We need one another's help and support. We need each other's love. And we need for other people not to be condemning and judging us, but to be coming and embracing us and lifting us up. And uh, that's, uh, that's a part of, uh, part of our struggle. In the 1950s, when people first started criticizing in the movies moralism, Moralism is the death of morality and the death of love. And uh, in, in a couple of the movies that I saw, I was a kid in those days, and they resonated with us because we saw the same hypocrisy and bigotry that we see today in, say, televangelists or something. And a girl would get pregnant out of wedlock, and of course, she'd be a total outcast, and nobody would speak to her, and she wouldn't be, if she went into church, everybody would stare at her until she was so uncomfortable she left. And yet, in, uh, I could see in, in our own Serbian church <clears throat> how something like that would happen and, and really everybody would rally around her and try to support her in that case. But I remember the confession scene in Dr. Zhivago, which was very touching. <clears throat> you know, Dr. Zhivago, because Zhivago means the one who's truly alive. That's what the name means. <clears throat> but when Laura comes to confession, because She's quite literally a whore. And uh, she comes to confession to the priest, and the priest asks her, uh, well, the woman taken in adultery, what did Christ say to her? And she said, he told her to go and sin no more. And the priest said, and did she? And Laura said, well, I don't know. And the priest says, nobody knows. Nobody knows, but we have to find a way to brighten her passion. So the best thing for you to do is to get married and uh, to help brighten your passion. Because otherwise, of course, it's going to totally destroy her. He's as much concerned about the fact that this passion is going to destroy her as he is saying that it's sin, you know, the way some people look at it. So uh, the, the idea, and here in Christ too, uh, why is it that he said the prostitutes and the publicans go into the heavenly kingdom before you? Because they knew how to repent. They knew there was something wrong and they knew how to repent. But those who think they're born again and self-righteous don't know how to repent. They don't even think they need to repent. Consequently, without repentance, you keep, your, your soul becomes uglier and uglier. And your heart becomes more filled with dirt. And part of that dirt is your own righteousness, which is its filthy rags before the Lord. So uh, it's not just physical illnesses that Christ is healing here. He's getting spiritual, moral illnesses, mental illnesses, the whole person. And now we have a complete revelation about the ministry of Christ on earth, ultimately to heal the fallen human nature and present a perfect human nature in himself that we can unite ourselves to and, um, and find our way through him back into paradise. But I, I can't go much further because we have to, like, we have to leave it one to serve the... Uh, the uh, funeral. But um, the second half of, of the second chapter of Mark and the third chapter of Mark we'll look at before. So we set the stage now with the revelation of what, how God is preparing people for what the Messiah is actually going to be. And Christ demonstrating what our salvation really consists of. What we're actually being redeemed from. Christ didn't die on the cross to save us from God as, as the West, the Latins and the Protestants teach. Uh, he, he redeemed us from the power of death and therefore from the power of Satan. He ransomed us from death and redeemed us from the power of evil, the power of the evil one, and made it possible then for us to be united totally with him and to enter into the heavenly kingdom. And this is all done through the healing process. It has nothing whatsoever to do with punishment. So, I'll leave it at that. Oh, come on in. Uh, anyway, I think, yeah.